This is the Chronicles Podcast, a production of Chronicles Magazine, the original outlet for paleoconservative thought and a bastion of the authentic right in America. Well, welcome back to another episode of Chronicles Magazine podcast. I'm delighted to have uh, Jared Lavelle with me today. I hope I pronounced that right. I've never actually said your name, but uh, we've known each other for a number of years. And originally we met within the context of the libertarian movement. And I know you've um, been to several events uh, with, with Paul Gottfried. So you're a friend of Chronicles, you're a friend of mine, and you're right within um, the correct milieu. So um, for those who don't know Jared, you know, he's a deacon at, in the uh, Reformed Episcopal Church in Pennsylvania, and he's also a classical educator. Um, and he's a great resource that I've taken advantage of in terms of just understanding American and, and European history, especially related to the American Revolution. So maybe we'll get into that too. But Jared, thank you for joining me. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Let's let's start at the beginning. Um you, I don't know if you were always, you know, in the Episcopalian Church, or if that's something that you kind of transformed into. But I knew you in the context of the Ron Paul years, um, which is, I think, where a lot of people, younger people, heard about Chronicles in the first place. I mean, that was the first uh, opportunity for them to sort of uh, distance themselves from the establishment GOP and the establishment Democratic Party, and really the regime, the post-war regime at large. Um, but as you've noticed and as I've noticed and as a lot of other people have recognized, um, libertarianism has taken a, a path um, at, at, at variance from from where we're interested in and from where we think we need to go. And th their description of the problems is not always on point, but always seems somewhat shallow. So we can get into that. But um, give me a little bit of your background, because I know the one book that you and I talked about years ago that really helped me and in, in my mind was the um, – was it the great debate? Is that what it's called? Um, so, yeah. So, so maybe let's set the stage with that book, um, if you can remember that far back in your journey. But um, th there, there's an important dynamic at play between what he describes as as the Paine's worldview and Burke's worldview. So maybe we can start there. And and why is that that dynamic relevant to um, sort of the the end of libertarianism? Yeah, it's a great book. It's one of the first books I always recommend to people when they're asking me about, you know, politics that they've 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 maybe just started paying attention to something and they want to understand more about, you know, what's going on in the world. And so I, I don't point them to a, a book, you know, on current events from a political commentator. I usually point them to Levin's book because it very much gets behind uh, the issues that are merely on the surface to talk about uh, philosophy, two different political philosophies with, with Burke and Paine. And so, um, uh, Burke, uh, give, or, uh, the, the value that I see in that, that book is that, um, it shows how, uh, Burke is, um, drawing on something a, a lot deeper than simply revolutionary, uh, principles. And, and he talks in that book about how Burke, excuse me, how Burke uh, um, is looking for continuity in in traditions, and how it's those uh, traditions that that give a a ballast to uh, any society that um, that prevent it from capsizing. So we would tend to Americans, if they, if you just asked anybody, you know, who would you identify? Assuming they've ever heard of Burke before, we'd usually identify with with Thomas Paine. Um, and what Levin does a great job of in that book is showing how uh, pain can be familiar to us, why it's familiar to us, but also what's problematic uh, about pain and how his ideas lead directly into uh, the French Revolution and the left mindset today. Um, what is the philosophy that connects a lot of these issues for the left? And so anyway, what that did is it showed me that um the there's not such a huge gap between the uh classical liberalism let's say and modern liberalism now we can debate that a little bit and and i'm sure listeners of, of this po podcast would would 
hold different positions along that spectrum of, of how much continuity or discontinuity between those there, there are between those two things. But uh, early in my thought, my idea was there's classical liberalism and then somehow modern li liberalism came along completely unrelated and these are so you 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 deride obama and pelosi and clinton and all of those and then just they're 180 degrees different from classical liberalism and to be fair that there it's true to a point but we have to really examine some of the propositions of classical liberalism and when we do we can find continuities between uh, some of your radical classical liberals like Paine, even some of the things that Jefferson says, and you can find a stream that comes down through someone like Woodrow Wilson and FDR and even comes into modern liberalism. And so um, that is one of the reasons I started uh, moving away from uh, libertarianism towards being a, a more out and out conservative philosophically. And I, I always define myself as such a conservative philosophically, not to be confused with you know, Fox News or something like that. But um, it, it's it's before it's a political question, it's a philosophical question. It's a disposition. Right. It's it's funny because once you read books like that and you begin to really peel back the layers of 20th century American ideological life, you realize that, you know, the and everyone knows, I mean, by now people recognize that the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are essentially on they represent um two interest groups within the regime apparatus, but even even like just the most basic um, principles of conservatism in its post-war uh, you know, genesis, it really does borrow from pain. And so we've kind of lost the Burkean worldview. And to be fair, the Burkean world itself is, has disintegrated, um, which, you know, it's, it's something that Paul Gottfried and I have talked about as well, you know, is, is a Burkean disposition called for in the present moment. And that's an interesting conversation too. But the fact of the matter is the 20th century is the inheritance of Paine's, uh, you know, political and, and hegemonic instincts on the world. Um, so like, just, just name a couple things. What, what about pain um, is, is relevant today? Why, why would we, why would we say that our world, despite the totalitarianism, you borrow is more from Paine's world than Burke's world? So if I could back up even before that, one of the, the, the things that really, one of the catalysts that really started um, opening my mind to this was a project um, I had to do my senior year, my last year of, of law school. And at the school I went to, um, they required us to write a 50-page uh, kind of like a master's thesis it's it, for the for the school uh, and our philosophy on some topic related to a philosophy of law and i chose the topic of because uh, i really want, had questions in my mind trying to answer the you know what's the difference between natural law mm -hmm. and natural right mm. and that's really what set me up looking at levin's book and and that's that's how we got into all this because i would hear um you know libertarian speakers talk about natural right natural right natural right and I, I didn't see how natural right, for example, uh, they would they would quote people like Aquinas or Augustine, and they would talk about this these terms. They'd use natural law and natural right interchangeably, and um, I didn't see how this led you to well, um, the just you are an individual, and therefore what you do with your life, and if you you know uh, is completely up to you, and. Uh, gay marriage is, you know, just something you can't interfere with. You know, there's, not, not, I don't mean to drop names, but, you know, somebody like Judge Napolitano, who, you know, professes to be a very orthodox Catholic, um, free Vatican II Catholic, and talks about natural right, natural law all the time, but then at the same time says, no, the courts cannot interfere with marriage. You know, gay marriage is a constitutional right, it's a natural right. And I just I, I just could not bring myself to say, I don't think Aquinas would have held that position. So I had to go back and I started reading. I read Richard Hooker and I read Thomas Aquinas and I started some Augustine and I read uh, a little bit from Coke. And I so I was reading down through these sources and just trying to trace out these two strands read from Hobbes and Locke as part of this project. I, I took on way more than I needed to for this project because it wasn't a, a project to check the box and get done. It was something I had real internal 
uh, questions about of trying to figure out where the break was. And I think I found it in, in it, it really starts with with Hobbes and with Locke is where you start seeing the uh, language of natural law transform into the language of natural right. Mm-hmm. It's particularly in Locke, where natural law is something that is objective and outside of you, whereas natural right in Locke's hands, as far as I uh, read him, and I'm pretty, there's some I, people I've talked to, knowledgeable people that have pushed back on me on this, but I'm, I, 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 I'm firmly believe this is what in in Locke's hands, what you get is the the nature of you get the language of law of nature. But what you find is law of nature for Locke is the right of the individual to be left alone, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that is the law of nature. And, and so instead of being external and objective, it becomes individualized. And it's the right of the individual to make their way in the world. And, to def- and, and ultimately, as I concluded in, in this project, you get to somewhere like, um, uh, what was it, Pennsylvania versus Casey, the uh, justice... Um, um uh who's the guy who Kavanaugh replaced justice um he was the swing but kennedy justice kennedy and uh yeah anthony kennedy uh in the planned parenthood pennsylvania planned parenthood v casey case that's the one so it was the early 90s case where where he says you know liberty is the mm-hmm. right to define your own existence and your own meaning of the universe and that's where we end up is is liberty is not just the right to be left alone, but the right to define your own existence. Mm-hmm. And so in that process, that's where I came across Levin's uh, book on Burke and Payne. And, and it was quite helpful in, in teasing some of those conclusions out. But yeah, in, in when you begin to, to back to your actual question, Payne, when you begin with the uh, individual, um and there is no social order there is nothing outside of the individual that constrains them you are really opening the door for the individual to define uh their own existence for example uh pain says that um he begins with this idea that you begin in the state of nature and again he's borrowing here from from Locke and from Rousseau and from Hobbes but his state of nature uh model is the the basis of government that we are first and foremost individuals uh as if we got dropped like the series lost on an island somewhere and that's how all of humanity began and then for convenience sake we decided to associate together to work together and then on top of that on top of society we build uh government mm-hmm. uh, it's, government's purely a necessary uh evil uh that we can simply rip down and and start over so all of these your social interaction whether it's political interaction or whether it's merely social be pre-political all of it is what pain would call art as in artificial it is made not natural Mm -hmm. Um, and so as long as these things are artificial um you can remake them because the individual is the only thing that is natural um, whereas Burke, uh, in one of my favorite passages from Burke ever that I, I quote a lot is uh, where he talks about from it's it's from his uh, letter from the new to the old Whigs, I believe, where he says, you know, dark and unscrupulous are the ways in which we come into the world that yeah. none of us have control over uh, how we were born, when we were born, what family we were born into. Uh, it's all uh, mystery. Our origins are mystery and we're born into something rather than choosing to define our own existence. And so mm-hmm. I would say that is uh, where you can get to from from pain to kind of the, the madness woke left stuff today is this idea that at the core of everything, we are individuals that can not just uh, pull down a government and, and put it back up, we can choose our own identities. And, and pain does this in a, in a, uh, nationalist kind of regard he Payne says that his nation are the people that agree with his principles so uh, and he acted right. that out i mean he right. was from from england and he uh leaves england comes over to america and we were cool for a while uh when we were in the midst of revolution these are my people and then right around the time of the washington administration he repudiates 
what America stands for and embraces France and says, my people are those who agree with me. And that I also, that resonated a lot with me and how a lot of, uh, again, I, I, maybe I'm painting too broad of a brush, but the libertarian mindset that as long as we, we don't have to have a heritage, we don't have to have a culture, we don't have to have a nation, we don't have to have borders, we don't have to have any of these other things in common. We just agree on these core principles of uh, do no harm and non-intervention, and those are our people, and we can just shift, and th those people can exist anywhere on the globe, um, but they're our people, and in fact, humans, I think, are more complicated than that. We have other loves besides uh, just a shared set of principles revolving around the individual. I mean, that sounds like a proto-proposition nation uh, concept. Very much so, yeah. Yeah. So let me shift gears a little bit because, but this is a related topic, I think. Um, you know, one of the things that you and I have talked about is just the phenomenon of of people on the internet. We can make fun of them, you know, that like the online trads, right? We can, they're fun to make fun of, but there's something going on here um, that you and I see that people have recognized where we're 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 um, looking for something deeper than just you know, the, the commercial world, the market, you know, the, the market-based order, things like that, where we're all just um, in community on the basis of our uh, commonality of interest, our commonality of consumption, you know, our jobs, there's something that has to be deeper. And that's, that's spilling into, you know, the rediscovery of traditionalist political uh, instincts, but it's also um, finds itself popping up in the world of religion as well. And, and, and you and I both know that the mainline uh, denominations and mainline churches are completely subverted and taken over, but there's still a very strong headway um, that's growing, I think, toward, you know, traditionalist uh, Catholicism and even Eastern, Eastern Orthodoxy and and even traditional Anglicanism and, and Episcopalianism. So do you think there's a commonality between people leaving libertarianism, but also leaving secularism in general? No, I, I, I've been thinking about this a lot, and, and I think there is, but I, it just struck me when you said people leaving libertarianism. <laughs> um, there, there wasn't that many to begin with, so I, I, sure. there's, a, there's a lot more, you know, evangelicalism, I think, is a bigger tent when I, I see people leaving, you know, libertarianism, relatively speaking, was always, you know, quite small. But yeah, there, uh, um, even if we wanted to broad it, broaden it beyond libertarianism, there are more people, I would say, becoming whether liberal or libertarian, um, being becoming more traditional and and skeptical of kind of these these common assumptions we just always believe to be true, right? So yeah, I do. So James Cobb uh, wrote a great book called The Tyranny of uh, Liberalism. And um, a great line that he uses in that book is he he talks about how liberalism is the idea that Everybody can um, everybody can be free to have their differences mm -hmm. um, as long as those differences don't matter. <laughs> right. Right. So that's liberalism. Like every you can be whatever you want up here. Right. Mm -hmm. So you want to be a Christian. You want to be you, you want to be a, a, a woman in a man's body or vice versa. You, you, you can be whatever you want. Um, but somebody is going to have to be the policeman. Right to keep everybody's individual beliefs from stepping on others. So as long as your differences of opinion don't actually take form, don't actually uh, become established in institutions, uh, are not actually enforced, in other words, as long as they don't matter, mm -hmm. uh, then you can be whatever you want. Um, and so this, I think, is liberalism's running into some some problems these days when you start to say oh well actually it looks from the it looks to me like there are some people who whose whose differences are supposed to matter i'm supposed to recognize certain people in their lifestyle right it's just certain other views like mine aren't supposed to matter right i'm not supposed to take account of what you look like or your religion or anything like that. But I am supposed to take, I am supposed to recognize you as part of LGBT or whatever. I'm supposed to recognize that. So we can see then that the mask of liberalism is starting to uh, to fall and that there are fingers on the weights of the scale, that there is no perfect society where everybody just gets along without anything, agreeing on anything except 
to agree to disagree. So it's because it's it's been exposed as somewhat of a fiction. Um, as far as um, religion and, and how you know people moving away from kind of mainstream evangelicalism towards you know traditionalism, whether it's traditional Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, Anglicanism, all of these. Um, so I was I was thinking about this recently, and you know, um, Christianity is itself a universal religion, not a regional one, right? Sure. So we don't have, you know, we don't believe in our river God, right? Or, and we don't have gods that just come from our particular part of the world. We believe in a religion in which God is sovereign over the whole universe and that Christianity uh, should be believed and embraced by everyone, right? So mm -hmm. there's a universalist element to Christianity. And uh, when the apostles went out from Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, we saw Christianity prove to be very adaptable to lots of different cultures. So we saw uh, the emergence of a Celtic church, uh, a Roman church, an Armenian church, an Indian church, a Middle Eastern Jewish church, right? A Constantin, uh, a church of Constantinople. It came into Africa and Ethiopia. It was very adaptable to various cultures. Um, mm -hmm. And the there's a, um, on the flip side of that coin, the danger of that is that Christianity can sometimes prove to be too adaptable, right? Whereas where you have culture influencing Christianity rather than Christianity influencing culture, right? So in the, the 1600s, just off the top of my head, for example, there was uh, the Jesuit missionaries in China mm -hmm. and uh, they would start, they were converting Chinese, but uh, the Chinese continued to worship their ancestors. And so the Jesuit missionaries at the time were saying, well, it's not, we can, we can live with that. They're just honoring their ancestors. And they tried to reconcile that and, and, and bring it into Christianity. And, and the papacy said, no, you, you can't. So um, there was an example of this with the French coming into North America as well. The French got along great with natives and they would even convert natives. And the natives would just basically say, yeah, we'll just add you, you know, another great spirit you know, to our spirits, right? And so there's too much assimilation where you lose the essence of Christianity in its adaptability. So that's the constant tension. Mm -hmm. But um, when Christianity took root in all of these different places around the world, it was enculturated. It was inculcated. It was instantiated. It took slightly different forms even though it held to some sort of doctrinal unity, right? So you Celtic Christianity, I'm speaking here as an, an Anglican, Celtic Christianity had its own tradition that was distinct in terms of its liturgy and 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 its its spirituality from say Roman Christianity, right? Going mm -hmm. way back to the beginning. It was enculturated in and it took took a, a a form, a unique form in each culture, even though it held to the same doctrines. And that's a good thing. That's a necessary thing. That's a human thing. That is, right. That's that's natural, right? What I think has happened with a lot of evangelicalism uh, today is the lack of enculturation. It's especially in the West, it's pulling back on this idea that, well, we serve Jesus, not nation, right? right? You'll get some dichotomy like that, you know, where it's Jesus first, it's about loving your, loving your neighbor and loving the outcast and loving the immigrant and all of that. And if you put any of the concerns of your nation or your people or your heritage or anything like that, that's just Jesus and. And any Jesus and anything is some evangelical leaders is heresy, right? You So what they've done is taken a, a part of the truth, which is that Christianity is universal and it is adaptable and it does cross borders and cultures and peoples. They've taken that half truth and denied the other half, which is that Christianity did when it spread, it, it, it adapted to a certain extent to each culture and became part of that specific 
uh, particular practice of Christianity in that part of the world, right? So it took a shape, a human shape, right? So, um, and, and so with that mistake, I think a lot of evangelical leaders are falling back on that in response to what the West is going through now. And mm-hmm. when the West now has lost its culture and its heritage, you've got a lot of evangelical leaders saying, oh, that's okay. Christianity isn't about a culture anyway. It's right. a big multicultural, uh, universal uh, phenomenon that in heaven there will be no people groups. We're all one in Christ. And I, it's can a half I, truth. It's can a I, ask you, truth. I want to ask you a controversial question. Do you think any of that, you know, the, just the complete separation of any culture from the universalization of Christianity, do you think any of that is sort of a liberalizing tendency of some of the Puritan instincts? So I would, okay, again, I'm an Anglican, so I I, <laughs> have, I don't have a problem reaching or even stretching sometimes to blame the Puritans for things. But I would, I'm not sure if I would say that the, the Puritans really represent that either. If, okay. um, if you, if you go to, um, you know, people like uh, Stephen Wolf or Time and Klein, you know, that that are much well better versed on Puritans than I. I think they would strongly, uh, if I said something like that and blame them, they would be able to quickly <laughs> refute me. So right. I, I'm hesitant to go there. Um, there, there are some things we can bl- blame on the Puritans, and I do. I'm not sure if that is one of them. But I'm just, the- I'm just curious, like in your opinion, if there's any connection between. Um, just sort of that milieu, the separation from classicalism, medievalism, you know, even the thinking of Thomas Aquinas that kind of um, was morphed or taken advantage of by the the pain, uh, you know, uh, just recreating society all the time type of thinking. Um, and maybe it's too complicated to flesh out here, but I, I wonder if those types of dynamics and relationships are worth exploring. I mean, it's possible, I'll, but I will say, I think a lot of even reformers that are not you know within my stream borrowed heavily from from aquinas in the middle ages even Mm -hmm. you know puritan presbyterian theologians um they don't come out where i come out but i uh they do heavily borrow from the medieval tradition so i I would be hesitant to accuse uh, them of that now what i would say is um i agree with you by the way i'm just playing devil's advocate here so keep going yeah, no, I, so what I would say, what I, I would say is maybe a, a weakness of the Puritan strain is the elimination of um, traditions and some of these cultural elements in favor of simplicity in worship, right? right? So the idea of stripping down the church calendar and stripping down the church, right, um, is a kind of narrowing of what Christianity uh, is in a way. It's, it's, um, you, uh, uh, in the say, in the name of purifying worship, you get rid of some of these traditions that preserve a culture, right? Mm-hmm. So if you say, you know, you don't celebrate Christmas and you don't celebrate Easter and you don't celebrate, you know, saints days and these parts of the year, you what do you do when you leave church? Well, then you end up celebrating a bunch of secular holidays, right? Right. And so, I don't think uh, it, it, it amuses me every Christmas season uh, to see some um, uh, d- dovetailing uh, with the far left and the, say, Puritan right <laughs> when it comes to <laughs> uh-huh. ironic, uh, the ironic bedfellows there. Um, but I do think, you know, something like Christmas is a time, you know, we can, um, you know, for those who would identify as Christian nationalists can say, hey, this is one of our traditions. You right. know, it's a church, it's a national thing, but it's also a Christian thing. This is where culture uh, and um, church uh, can merge together and we can celebrate these things together. There's a sense of usness, right? When mm-hmm. when we do that. And um, and and so I, I think these are good things for it when it comes to not only within the church, uh, but also within culture, giving a sense of we. Right, providing a sense of we throughout through our our uh, calendar throughout the year, rather mm-hmm. than just you know su- Sundays separate from all of these other secular things. Yeah, 
let's shift gears a little bit and talk about you know the so-called evangelical elite or the regime evangelicals um but, but uh just to play into that a little bit uh you know what's your own religious background are you a sort of a new um, discoverer of traditional christianity or is that your own background nope i'm i'm a discoverer uh i was raised uh baptist um I was a, and not a Reformed Baptist or anything like that, just a kind of an independent, mm -hmm. fundamental uh, uh, Baptist. Um, I didn't have, you know, any kind of horrifying experience. <laughs> Sometimes there are uh, people who who get the public stage, get a microphone today, and then all they want to do is talk about, you know, how bad their upbringing is. And that's why right. um, they, they've had so much trauma, right, here, you know, <laughs> in the Bible. And so this is why they've de deconstructed and all of that. I, I didn't have uh bad uh, a bad experience um it was not as enriching as what i have uh experienced as an as an adult as i've grown and so i'm trying to do better for my own children in that regard but i don't uh, i i appreciate my upbringing and uh for what my parents did what my church sure. did people in my life did and that's part of you know you know just as a side that's part of being a conservative too right um sure. being, uh, having gratitude for where you came from even if you desire to improve on it mm -hmm. so um so uh i was uh baptist uh when i went to college i became um let's call it you know a, a five point calvinist uh baptist um i was in the military while well, I was in college. I was deployed in the middle of my college experience to Iraq. And it was actually there where I fully embraced a kind of what we would say a reformed mm -hmm. uh, worldview. Um, because one of the guys I was deployed with was also a uh, a reformed uh, reformed influence. And, and so I was reading a lot, you know, while I was gone. And so... Um, and then uh, a few years after that, um, I went so far into the Reformed uh, world that I uh, became a Presbyterian and, and left uh, my uh, Baptist uh, background uh, behind, um, listened to a series of, of debates and read books and became uh, convinced of, of paedo-baptism. Uh, that was about 2010. And then um, I've moved now to uh, Anglicanism. And, and I've said I've, I've been here for about, what has it been, uh, eight, nine years now. So um, the, one of the, the major influences uh, was in, in making this, this last movement towards Anglicanism was um, a broader kind of church rather than um, I, I appreciated the disposition of Anglicans as opposed to some of my Presbyterian experience where it was always marking out differences from other pe uh, Presbyterians or Reformed people who might have half of a percentage difference in, in the way they articulate things. And I uh, I also appreciated the, the, the cultural uh, baggage, and I'm using that in a positive way, of right. Anglicanism, that it's, you know, it's not just a narrow set of, you know, you know, beliefs on Calvinism, right? But it's, mm -hmm. um, it's in, it's really inculturated. And then especially in liturgy. And so um, I read a book by a guy who teaches, I think he still teaches at Calvin College named James, named uh, James K.A. Smith. Um, he's, I, I, I wouldn't recommend everything that he does. He's kind of really gone much more liberal these days. But um, he wrote a book called Desiring the Kingdom where he talks about the role of uh, uh, liturgy as formation, um, the educational role of liturgy. And, um, you know, uh, we often think in the world that I came from is education is just about, hey, let's just have one more service. Let's have one more catechism class. Let's right. have you know, one more systematic theology book. It's let's all in your head. Right, it's all in right. your head. And, right. Yep. Yep. And so, um, I even expressed that to a former uh, pastor. I was like, you know, some of our youth are not, don't really seem into it at the church I was at. And they're like, well, maybe we need another catechism class. Maybe we should have another service on this. And I said, I just don't think that one more is one more sermon, one more class, one more is, is just more information drilled more is going to, to do it. And so 
um, I started drawing on the, this the Smith's book where he's talking about the, the church recognized for a very long time that formation is in habit, mm -hmm. right? So you, things become habituated over time. You, you repeat them, you say them over and over again. And, and how that, uh, how liturgy actually kept people in the church mm -hmm. for, for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what James Smith does in his book, Desiring the Kingdom, that was really eye-opening was he exposed the fact that we are, we are liturgical people and we engage in liturgies all the time. Mm -hmm. So he begins the book by describing an experience. Um, and he, when you're reading it, you initially think he's describing a church experience and he's describing driving into the parking lot, walking in the doors of the building, and he's just observing things. And you think this is some big mega church you're walking into some or some great cathedral. And by the, he starts giving clues away in this description. By the end of it, you realize you're actually standing in a mall. <laughs> and so he breaks down the liturgy of shopping. Right. Why do people shop in a mall? Why he, he breaks down the architecture of a mall. Why is a mall built like it is, right? Right. With, you know, you can't see outside. There aren't windows. You lose track of time. Mm -hmm. There's only, you know, glass up, you know, up on high. So you can look up. It's and and you go in and out of your little shops and you make purchases that make you feel good. It's mm -hmm. it's a therapeutic experience it's a quasi religious experience right and it's a, there's a whole liturgy that's been well thought out by advertisers by architects by everybody involved in this right he does that again with the stadium right during a, a football game he mm -hmm. does the same sort of thing and, and or the liturgies of college and he talks about you know people worry about their kids going to college and losing their faith well it's not because they, they don't lose their faith because some professor just provides a killer argument right yeah that, just cause, cause, that they say oh i guess i just don't believe it. no that is used as the excuse to right. walk away. Uh, what in fact happens is loves are changed Mm -hmm. Because you embrace the college party atmosphere and there's things that you want, right? That the flesh that you want, right? And you can't justify them. So what you need is a nice liberal professor to say everything you've ever been taught is bunk and here's a good scientific philosophical reason for it to give you cover to do what you want, right? Right. And so it's it's the issue of loves and it goes back to Augustine in that regard. This Augustine is his finger on this when he says you know right at the beginning of confessions that are our, our, uh, we were made for god and our hearts are restless until they rest in god as human beings we are not just static creatures we're not just uh thinking things that if you just logically work you know to a conclusion we'll we'll get there and we're static otherwise mm -hmm. no we are lovers we are aimed at something we are in motion um and it's a matter of redirecting that motion uh, toward what is most lovely and most valuable and what is what's true, good and beautiful, to put it uh, that way in the traditional sense. So um, understanding this role of liturgy uh, in doing that, forming habits and forming loves uh, is really what brought me over to uh, to the Anglican uh, tradition because I, I think, wasn't. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think what you just did there is you repudiated um you know some of the instincts of like the post enlightenment thinking about the world and what it means to be an individual and um you know just the emphasis on agreeing with propositions and living only in your mind whereas you know the person that we started off talking about Edmund Burke you know he talks about the pre rationality of man the sentimental aspects of man that um, are sort of the bedrock from which you know, rationality is sort of laid on top of them. We're not uh, blank slate people that are just processing propositions and, and logical arguments and stuff, but we actually have something far deeper um, that's even uh, that exists before our even cognizant. You know, we're even cognizant of of the reality of these things, and that's consistent with, you know, what Richard Weaver talks about. And ideas have consequences. You know, with the unsentimental sentiment. Um, but when you pay attention to these things and and the pre rationality of man, you have to focus on uh, his heritage, his community mm -hmm. that preceded right. his own existence. And suddenly, you're wrapping yourself into the tr uh, traditionalist uh, frame of of right. mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and that there are things that that you find out that um, pull you together 
more than just what like I was talking about earlier pain saying the group that agrees with me is my country right mm -hmm. so there are there are more of these uh what do I want to say uh hooks into a person right that bind them uh more than just you know I agree with the same set of propositions right mm -hmm. um, so uh, those family connections those cultural connections that all of these things are actually what hold society together. Now, again, this is not to denigrate ideas. I don't. Sure. Uh, there's, a, there's a there's a opposite reaction here that can go too far. That uh, and you see it in some liberal churches where they they actually maintain some sort of liber uh, liturgy, right? Right. But they don't actually believe the doctrines anymore because the doctrines are important, right? Whether it's sure. church, whether it's you know propositions are important. It's just we are as creatures, we're not actually, uh, as Descartes would have us believe, thinkers first. Uh, right. We don't begin with thought, right? We must use thought. Thought's important. We're, that's a part of what we are as humans, but we don't begin there. Um, mm -hmm. We begin as lovers uh, with attachments that are chosen really for us, right? Mm -hmm. Parents, our community. Uh, the language we be we we don't just come into the world and say I want to speak this language. We, you speak what what your where your culture is, who your family is, right? And so um, that's a more complete picture of the human person uh, than this idea that you know we just share a few ideas in common. And and so what liberalism does, circling back to kind of where you started, uh, liberalism says basically all of these other things that make you human don't have to matter right. um, we can have a common denominator which is this one idea that uh we just agree to disagree and as long as you can consume and get ahead as long as you can live the way you want to live we can all agree to that premise and all of these other things don't have to get in the way of that mm -hmm. and uh that worked for a little while um but it only worked because we had a common exactly, <laughs> exactly. culture yeah exactly right because the unstated assumption behind this was you had a a very much a, a common culture with common beliefs you might have had people that were nominal in their faith right um but but you still had a bunch of shared assumptions that that you know in this in and it's only in that context where you could have liberalism it's like um right 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 like Mark Stein, you know, once said about, um, uh, you know, multiculturalism is a unicultural phenomenon, right? You don't see multiculturalism anywhere else in the world. There's only one part, <laughs> part of the world where you see multiculturalism. Um, and the only reason you could have as much difference as you could in this culture is because there was a set of shared assumptions. And as that foundation is broken uh, down, um, people are recognizing it. And I think it it is the the search for roots, the search for depth beyond just this common assumption that, you know, just get along uh, to, to get, go along to get along and, you know, agree to disagree is, it doesn't leave you with much at the end of the day in terms of your affections and desires, except go pursue the the newest radical thing, you know, to, to fulfill that whole, to create your identity again. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and this this sort of plays into, and I know we've got like ten minutes left or so. I don't want to take all your time on this Thanksgiving Eve, but um, this plays into the evangelical elite because they really, um, in this way, have a liberal instinct, where um, they refuse to recognize the important bedrock aspects of heritage America um, and even just our Western European cultural roots. And you know, they they treat the world as if. If everyone just agrees, the solution, the political solution is that everyone just needs to believe in the gospel. I mean, that's the sort of the Christianized version of the liberal instinct. So I guess, do you have any elaboration or comment, uh, you know, commentary on on the, the current state of the evangelical elite and, and what they don't get about people pursuing something deeper? Mm. Well, yeah, I, I think this goes, uh, this criticism actually applies not only to the evangelical elite, but even to those who might um consider that you know they may not consider themselves evangelical elite and may, may even at points be critics but i think they suffer from the same issue and you see this in some of the neo-calvinist uh circles which right. is um there's is, is kind of what you said is that you know the answer is just you know believe the gospel and then what that will do is it will 
furnish you with a set of lenses called a Christian worldview, Mm -hmm. and then people will just start voting the same way. So (laughs) when it comes to politics, all we need to do is people believe the gospel, and then they'll start voting Republican, and that'll solve the problems, and then all those political questions will take care of themselves because people got to have their worldview glasses. Well, I don't know if you've looked recently. There's a lot of people who, um, you know, believe or claim to be Christians that vote and have voted Democrat. Right. So, the, um, you know, the, when the uh, that Dobbs decision came out last year, there were a lot of people who were, you know, and are Christians who didn't really have much to say in terms of celebrating that decision. Right. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of people I started hearing from that I just always assumed were pro-life that said, oh, but the poor the poor woman, you know, this is you know, we need to be more merciful. And they were lamenting the Dobbs decision. I thought. You know, I looked around and I, I started thinking, I thought all these people were on my team. I didn't, it took the Dobbs decision to expose the fact that maybe they were not on the same team anymore. So one, it, we shouldn't assume that that soon as people believe the gospel, they automatically change their voting pattern, mm-hmm. right? Um, and furthermore, we shouldn't assume that just because people believe the gospel, that they are now experts on international relations and economics and all of these issues and this is something i know stephen wolf has been hammering you you Mm -hmm. know just because you are a uh, a pastor does not mean that you're an expert on all of these policy issues right right? now there was a day when pastors in early america were the experts on all the issues because they they you know but it wasn't go to them it wasn't by position it wasn't by virtue of their position in the church well, r- not just that, right? It's because they were well read, right? It's because right. You, they they were steeped in philosophy. They they understood all the categories of of thought. Exactly. They were they were logically they were classically trained. They understood logic and they understood consequences. And you have people like John Witherspoon, you know, who wrote an economics book on monetary policy mm-hmm. as a pastor, right? Right. Uh, why? Because they knew what they were talking about. Today, you go and you get your theology education which has none of that in it. Um, and you're not even expected to read anything like philosophy, not much anyway. And now uh, you're a pastor and now you, if you're a Christian, you're a pastor, then just whatever your opinion happens to be is the biblical one, right? Without thinking through, uh, uh, you know, implications, uh, long-term consequences, or or even having the categories to to process it. So, um, so yeah, I... I Ultimately, yes, in the spiritual sense, of course, redeeming the culture requires uh, embracing the gospel, right? But the idea that all we need is, you know, preach the gospel and everybody's going to start voting differently. Everybody's going to be knowledgeable on every policy issue and all of these problems are going to be solved from a physical, earthly, temporal uh, standpoint I don't, uh, I don't quite uh, buy that. We have a lot more in terms of educating that needs to be done in order right. to, it, to it, accomplish. It does sort of rely on an optimistic view of man and society. Um, you know, when you treat things like that, and I don't want to call out names, but I have someone particular in mind, and he was opposing the woke left and the critical theory and sort of the um, affirmative action approach to solving problems. And his entire approach is we don't need any of that, which is right. But his solution is all we need is the gospel. And again, you know, that completely um, ignores um, the the bedrock, uh, you know, hegemonic aspect of, of man and, and the need that he has for culture and the need that he has for commitment uh, and loyalty to his community, his heritage and his ancestors. Uh, you need those things. Those are the things that anchor the social order. Um, and Christianity can, like you said, can adapt itself to those things. Um, but when we turn Christianity into a revolutionizing spirit, when we turn it into you know a tool that that someone like Payne would use, um, we we cannot reach the perfections that we pursue. So. Well, I think that's um, that's it for an hour's conversation. Um, I always like to end on this. I know I hate this question because it's hard to think on top of your head, but if there's any books along the way that have helped you sort of rethink the paradigm, I know we did mention the uh, the Great Debate, um, but are there any others that come to mind that really um, people should read to dispose the liberalism that maybe has uh, you know clung with them over the years? 
I don't know if I have um, any that are super unique that for this for this audience. I would probably give uh, Kirk mention Kirk and Weaver, which I would assume everybody <laughs> has either mm -hmm. heard of or are familiar with to some extent. But also, um, uh, maybe the other book that I did mention that might be less well known is is James James Collins' book, uh, The Tyranny of Liberalism. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a provocative title, but he, it's not clickbaity. Um, it's not a title that's out there trying to you know. You see some of those titles by you know conservative talk show host authors that have this you know how Obama ruined this and messed up this and messed up that. You know, it's a really long title. <laughs> It's meant for clicks, right? Um, this is not, um, in, and it is. I, it's actually something I use when I um, teach my last classes of the year in European history, um, trying to understand the world we live in now. Um, and and it is uh, quite transformative in terms of people's my students thinking in in because they don't have a category for thinking of liberalism as a as tyranny. Sure. Uh, and so it flips all of these things on its uh, on their heads, the, the language on its head and uh, does a really good job of explaining how uh, this is. So so I would say the I think somebody called. I think Gottfried has an endorsement on the back of that book, if I recall. Um, yeah. yeah. And they're friends anyway. So it's endorsed by you. It's endorsed by us. Um, but thank you, Jared, for your time. And I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving and, and perhaps we can do this again. Thank you. Same to you. Take care.